Hughes changed the world. His high-speed aircraft were prototypes for future fighter planes. He jump-started commercial aviation with airplanes that flew higher and faster than the competition. His big dreams required new aircraft control systems, still in use today. His engineers made the first remote control missiles a reality and made live TV possible around the globe. Christmas Eve, 1905. Howard Robard Hughes Jr. was born. But as in much of his life, even his birth date can be questioned. There was no official birth certificate on file. What is known is that his parents fostered young Howard's interest in all things mechanical. As a child, he took everything apart so that he could put it back together again. He took a bicycle and modified it with a motor. And his mother called the local newspaper and Howard was photographed holding the first motorized bicycle in Houston. Hughes got his pilot's license in 1928 and bought himself a biplane. He could well afford to indulge in expensive toys. His father was the developer of a specialized oil drilling bit that made the Hughes family wealthy. Uh, the Hughes drill bit revolutionized oil drilling and that immediately made Hughes Tool Company an extremely valuable property. So Hughes early on saw the power that inventions can have in changing our way of life and in, and in making certainly a lot of money. Young Howard, anxious to make his mark in the world, left Houston before completing college and moved to Los Angeles to make movies. In 1930, he made a name for himself as a film director with Hell's Angels, a World War I aerial epic. He would later make The Outlaw, starring Jane Russell. Hollywood legend has it that, using his knowledge of aerodynamics, he designed an underwire bra that helped her stand out as an actress. Apparently, it was so uncomfortable she never wore it in the movie. Hughes continued to make movies, but he also turned his focus to flying and designing aircraft. By the summer of 1935, Hughes decided he wanted to set a new aircraft speed record. He hired two men to help make his dream come true. He had a fellow by the name of Glenn Odekirk, who was working on his airplanes, who became an expert mechanic. And he hired a fellow by the name of Dick Palmer, uh, who was probably one of the best airplane designers of that time. In the capable hands of Odekirk and Palmer, Hughes' dream took shape as a plane he called the H-1. They referred to this as an engine with a saddle on it, because the cockpit is very small, and there's just not much wiggle room inside. But it was designed uh, for high speed, and that's, that's what he got. Like other fast, small planes, it was a single-seater with an open cockpit and a lot of horsepower. But Hughes' quest for speed took the H-1 into uncharted design territory. There was a bell-shaped engine cowling to reduce airframe drag, a wing curve that stabilized airflow, and landing gear that retracted into the fuselage. The streamlining continued with a new technique. Rivets and joints were fabricated flush against the aircraft's smooth aluminum skin. But it was his airplane. He supervised every bit of the design. That Hughes played such an important part in the conceptual design of the H-1 was remarkable. He had no formal training in engineering, but he had an unquenchable thirst for knowledge. Howard Hughes was one of the world's great brain pickers and he would sit with the engineers who were working on designs and how do you solve this and how do you solve that problem and what do you do for this and what do you do for that he literally picked their brains of the things they were doing and knew what they were doing he was a very smart guy and he certainly had certain interests in mathematics and science uh he was fascinated by how engines work um not only how that you can make them go faster but he, but he was interested in electronics in general Hughes' new invention, the H-1, was ready on September 13, 1935. Serving as his own test pilot in the racer, he set a new world speed record of 352 miles per hour, passing the existing mark of 314 miles per hour. He was so happy with the results of the speedy plane that he kept it aloft longer than he should have. 
true to Hugh's fashion, he kept flying pass after pass after pass, hoping that he could end up with a higher speed, and eventually ran out of gas, landed gear up in a beet field, damaged the airplane, didn't hurt himself. The first thing he told to Oda Kirk when he came out is, she'll fly faster, Odie, she'll fly faster. I know I can do 365. I looked about and decided this field was the best spot. Put the plane down here where the retractable landing gear retracted as landings in rough country are safer with the wheels up. Hughes went on to break the transcontinental record with the H-1 racer, flying at high altitude and breathing compressed oxygen in the cabin. The thin air made for greater speeds, and the trip from Burbank to Newark took just 7 hours, 28 minutes, and 25 seconds. Next, Hughes wanted to fly around the world faster than anyone ever had. And in the process, beat Charles Lindbergh's 33 and a half hour record time to Paris, set in 1927. But in technological terms, Hughes' journey would vastly differ from Lindbergh's. The aircraft Hughes chose was the Lockheed 14, a twin engine 12 passenger airplane. It would need significant modification to make it worthy of the proposed around the world flight. The Lockheed was fitted with two specially supercharged Wright G-102 Cyclone engines. And Hugh spared no expense to outfit the plane with the latest navigation equipment. You go back to Lindbergh. I mean, Lindbergh was one fellow in a small cockpit with a handful of gauges flying across the Atlantic. Uh, the cockpit of the Lockheed 14 was absolutely jammed with instruments of every conceivable kind. He was one of this, not just to be a triumph of courage, uh, which is what everybody thought of, of Lindbergh, and rightly so. He wanted it to be very much a triumph of science. The resourceful aviator also planned on having help from the ground. He had set up communications with all the ham operators around the world so they could track him where he was, we know his location. On July 10th, 1938, the weather was good, and Hughes said the Lockheed was ready to go. The aircraft was so heavy with fuel that Hughes almost ran out of runway before he was airborne. But the speed of Hughes' journey astonished the world. He and his crew of four reached Paris in 16 hours and 38 minutes, cutting Lindbergh's time in half. After another seven hour and 51 minute flight, Hughes reached Moscow. A 30 hour and 18 minute series of flights after that, they landed in Fairbanks, Alaska. Then, after another 16 hour and 27 minute flight, at 2.37 p.m. on July 14th, 1938, Hughes completed the last part of the trip from Fairbanks to Minneapolis to New York. The entire trip had taken just three days, 19 hours, and 17 minutes. The following day, more than a million people lined the sidewalks of New York City for a ticker tape parade for their hero, who had circled the globe. He wanted to bring attention to himself as an aviation pioneer, a scientific pioneer. And he was also, he wanted to see exactly how much of the new technology at the time could be put to work in a way that was safe and would show people the potential wonders of air travel. After developing aviation technology, Hughes felt he was ready to develop his aviation business. In May 1939, he began buying stock in an airline that would become known by its initials, TWA. Hughes knew just the plane he wanted TWA to fly, the Lockheed Constellation. He set the design spec high, demanding powerful engines. The Constellation was a, a technologically refined aircraft. It had a high power to weight ratio, and it developed a lot of thrust for a comparatively small airframe. 3350 engines allowed the, the Constellation to cruise comfortably at 330 miles an hour, you know, faster than a lot of the American contemporary fighter aircraft at the time. Powerful engines were only one part of the equation. Since the Constellation flew at high altitude, this required a pressurized cabin one of the first available in a commercial aircraft. 
a pressurized cabin enables you to uh, give better comfort to passenger and crew at higher altitudes. You can control temperature and pressure, which allows you to basically travel in your shirt sleeve at 20,000 feet, where if you're unpressurized, you'd be in, uh, you know, minus double digit temperatures. You'd have, you'd need to be breathing on oxygen. Otherwise, you'd be, you'd be unconscious. Another interesting aspect of the Constellation design was its triple fin tail. And the reason that was necessary is with the enormous power and, and wake turbulence generated by the 15-foot propeller arc of the uh, 3350 engines, they needed to extend the tail wide enough to give it stability so they could uh, control lift with the elevators. And the three tail fins gave it lateral stability so it wasn't, wasn't wobbling in the air. Something that you, you don't see on any other aircraft. When the first 1649 Connie came off the line and Howard took delivery himself because he was able to fly it. And there are people who tell stories of him literally going into the cockpit, looking through the, the manuals and so forth, and then flying the airplane all by himself. As one of the few aviation leaders who could fly his own product, Hughes developed a clear vision for commercial air travel. Larger, faster planes to maximize passenger comfort as well as airline profit. But just as the first constellations were ready, they were pressed into service in World War II. All available men and materials would be diverted toward the coming military struggle. Howard Hughes wanted to be part of it. It might be said that modern war is a contest driven by technology. But even before conflicts were waged by remote control or using supercomputers, the machines of war had to employ cutting-edge technology. Howard Hughes, who would develop helicopters, missiles, and other advanced weaponry, understood this. In 1941, the 36-year-old invented a flexible ammunition line for fighter planes that would efficiently feed bullets to their guns. This qualified Hughes as a military supplier, exempting him from military service. Hughes was also hard of hearing due to otosclerosis, a gradual thickening of a bone in the inner ear. He didn't serve in the military. But an ammunition line wouldn't be the only way Hughes would contribute to the war effort. German U-boats were decimating Allied transports attempting to cross the Atlantic. The Allies had a solution in mind a giant flying boat. An aircraft that could land on water and carry needed troops and materiel. The answer is this giant airplane where we can fly over the North Atlantic and carry tanks and troops and equipment far above the German submarines in the North Atlantic. Aviation pioneer James Martin was the first to conceive of a flying boat and shared the idea with Winston Churchill, who passed it on to FDR. Henry Kaiser, the boat builder famous for his Liberty ships, got on board to promote it and convinced Howard Hughes to build a prototype. Kaiser approached Hughes because he was an aviation hero with a reputation for solving engineering problems. The military restricted the materials that might be used to fabricate the experimental aircraft. This was the first puzzle facing Hughes. They couldn't use strategic materials like aluminum, so it handicapped him, and that's why he went to wood. When you build a plane out of metal, you know what each piece of metal weighs. There's a constant there. But that's not true with wood. Every piece of wood has a different weight than another piece of wood, so the complexity of building that plane, of bonding that wood to the, to the, to the surface and, and, and balance to it, was a monumental achievement. In November of 1942, Hughes and Kaiser obtained $18 million in government financing to build three flying boats. The design called for an aircraft capable of carrying 750 troops, having eight 3,000 horsepower engines, and wings longer than any aircraft ever built an impressive span of 320 feet. At first it was called the HK-1, the H for Hughes, the K for Kaiser, 
but after Kaiser dropped out of the project, Hughes named it the H-4 Hercules. It later became known, much to his annoyance, as the Spruce Goose. Hughes always uh, referred to it as my flying boat. It was called the Hughes Flying Boat and coined by the press as a, a Spruce Goose. Howard Hughes knew that the sheer size of his aircraft would require new ways for a pilot to fly it. That was because control surfaces, such as rudders and flaps, were too large and too heavy for a pilot to move by simple mechanical means. It was a huge hydraulic problem. To be able to move those heavy controls the half the length of a football field took some technology. Working with his engineers, Hughes developed the first artificial field system for control surfaces. For each pound of pressure exerted on the rudder pedal in the cockpit, the rudder at the rear of the aircraft received 200 pounds of pressure. The system worked by means of hydraulic pumps. When the pilot moved the controls in the cockpit, hydraulic fluid triggered a relay valve. This admitted pressurized oil into a cylinder that in turn moved the control surface. The flying boat took three years to construct. World War II ended before this aviation marvel was completed. But in Washington, lawmakers didn't see the project as a triumph of aviation design. They saw it as a post-war white elephant and money pit. In August 1947, the Republican senator from Maine, Ralph Owen Brewster, launched an inquiry into Hughes' supposed misappropriation of funds to build a useless aircraft. It was an effort to discredit Hughes as a pilot and aircraft manufacturer, and Hughes took it seriously, and he grabbed an armful of manila folders and took on the Senate. Senator Brewster's story, as related here yesterday, is a pack of lies, and I can tear it apart if allowed to cross-question him. As you'll see in some of the, the Senate hearing clips, that uh, he was amazing. I put the sweat of my life into this thing. I have my reputation rolled up in it, and I have stated several times that if it's a failure, I'll probably leave this country and never come back, and I mean it. I don't think he would have said that unless he felt in his gut that it was airworthy. The government cleared Hughes of any wrongdoing, but he still wanted to prove to the world that the flying boat was worthwhile. He had it moved to a launch site in Long Beach Harbor near Los Angeles. This required transporting it in pieces by truck for 26 miles over a period of two days. Then on Sunday, November 2nd, 1947, Hughes took a seat at the controls. He told the media that he would taxi the flying boat in Long Beach Harbor for a demonstration run. But then Hughes did something that surprised even the crew aboard the aircraft. It must have felt good after two high-speed taxis because he taxied back, picked all the press off, except for one fellow that had the latest recording equipment. And when the co-pilot uh, said he asked for 90, uh, 15 degree flaps, he knew it was going up because it was wanting to leave the ground at 90, and sure enough, it did. For a throttle, it's 60, it bounces at 65, it's 70, it's 75. And I believe we are airborne. We are airborne, ladies and gentlemen. We were really up in the air. The uh, guy interviewing him during the flight, the one person that was on board with a wire recorder, and said, Mr. Hughes, were you surprised when the airplane took off the water? Howard, did you expect that? Yes, sir, certainly. I'd like to make surprises. And Howard answered, I'd like to make surprises. Howard Hughes flew the flying boat to an altitude of 70 feet and a distance of about one mile across the waters of Long Beach Harbor. It never flew again. But Hughes considered it one of his greatest accomplishments. The flying boat was as close to Hughes' heart as any single enterprise he ever undertook. When he really wanted to impress somebody, he would give them a tour of the flying boat. Hughes kept his flying boat flight ready in a hangar for decades. I think this is the idiosyncratic Mr. Hughes. They would periodically turn over the engines to make sure they were OK. In 1982, the flying boat was put on exhibit in Long Beach. And in 1995, was moved to a museum in Oregon. Built of wood to solve a wartime materials crisis that passed, the flying boat was never put into regular production. 
but the artificial feel system Hughes pioneered remains in use today. The flying boat still holds the record as the biggest wooden seaplane ever built, and it was a forerunner to aircraft such as the C-130. Although many thought the flying boat would sour Hughes' relations with the military forever, in the coming decade, a sweet reward was on its way for Howard Hughes. As World War II transitioned to the Cold War, Howard Hughes believed military contracts would be profit centers for his companies. Accordingly, he pushed forward with a design for a military photo reconnaissance aircraft called the XF-11. It was a very efficient airfoil. It was expected to fly up over 40,000 feet, which was very high altitude in the, the 1940s, and even have a range up to 5,000 miles. Although some military historians suggest that Hughes XF-11 is a forerunner of the famed U-2 spy plane of the 1960s, structurally, it's closer to the twin-boom World War II fighter, the P-38. A significant feature of Hughes aircraft was its counter-rotating props, a feature that he insisted upon because it would add power and therefore speed. Double uh, propellers, and one goes clockwise and one goes counterclockwise, so you get a little extra thrust by, uh, by doing that. Again, a very revolutionary idea in that time period. On Sunday, July 7th, 1946, when Hughes flew the prototype, it would be a flight he would remember for the rest of his life. He was anxious to get the plane into the air and neglected to take standard safety precautions. He was supposed to have 600 gallons of fuel on board. He put 1,200 gallons of fuel on board. He was supposed to have a chase aircraft on a similar frequency. They were on different frequencies. About an hour and 15 minutes into the flight, Hughes noticed something wrong. One of the two props on the right side had gone into reverse. The XF-11 began to pull right as Hughes fought to turn the plane to the left. So now he had one propeller in high pitch, giving him thrust, and one in reverse, just like you experience when you land in an airliner and they go into reverse, and we all hear the noise and the effect of that. When it smashed into a Beverly Hills home and burst into flames, the XF-11 was traveling at 155 miles per hour. Hughes was badly injured. He uh, severely cracked his skull, uh, broke all the ribs on his heart side, dislodged his heart, broke his legs, some burns. But he survived. During his recovery in the hospital, a period of a month and a half, Hughes was given morphine for pain. And later, doctors allowed Hughes to give himself injections of codeine, a derivation of morphine that doctors believed to be less addictive. While he was in the hospital, he designed the modern day hospital bed. He had engineers design servos so that uh, the bed he could turn because of his burns. It's pretty interesting. His mind never really stopped. While recuperating and tinkering with his hospital bed, Hughes spoke with Glenn Odekirk, his chief engineer. Together, they realized that the counter-rotating props were the flaw in the XF-11. Hughes ordered a second prototype of the aircraft built without them. Although he kept up the appearance of being in command and later successfully flew the second prototype, the aviator who emerged from the hospital on August 12, 1946, was a vastly different man. He had a secret. And that was that he was going to continue taking these medicines. And I think what happened is he kind of had the makings of being an obsessive compulsive disorder personality, but the medicines amplified that even more. Obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, is a form of mental illness that causes sufferers to engage in repetitive acts and to be consumed with irrational fears, in Hughes' case, to fear germs. One thing everybody needs to understand is, at the time, um, obsessive compulsive disorder had not been diagnosed. Nobody knew what the heck it was. The eccentric millionaire demanded that his aides use Kleenex to hand him any object. He wants to use a Kleenex to hold against everything, so he doesn't touch it. He doesn't want to touch a doorknob because he's worried about who touched it before. 
the U.S. Air Force canceled the XF-11 program in a cost-cutting measure. The decision left Hughes frustrated. He thought the aircraft was ahead of its time. But his genius for design aside, the U.S. military reportedly found Hughes difficult to work with on a personal level. Howard was kind of of the thinking that if you designed the fastest plane in the world, the military would be knocking on your door and want to buy them. And that's not the way the military does it. They, they determine specifications, and they go out and they compete these specifications. And you make a bid, and then you're responsible to do exactly what you said you'd do in the contract. And that's not the way Howard operated. He was his own man. He, he did it the way he wanted to do it. Despite this, Hughes was, as always, determined to obtain more military contracts for his companies. He saw a future in something called electronics. He was working with some of his people to find an electronic hearing aid that would improve his hearing. And though the word electronics was hardly even known, he recognized that electronics that somehow might be able to provide the answer. In late 1948, electronically enhanced target tracking was high on the list of United States Air Force projects. Military planners wanted equipment that allowed fighter planes to destroy enemy aircraft in any weather, day or night. Engineers at Hughes Aircraft have been working on a guidance system project for months. Being ahead of the curve paid off. The Air Force awarded an $8 million contract to Hughes Aircraft to build and install Falcon missile weapon systems in 200 Lockheed F-94 fighters. The Falcon missile was an Air Force project that was tended to be launched at enemy bombers. The pilot would find the target on his own radar, and then he would tell the missile, in effect, where to look. In 1951, Hughes built a missile manufacturing facility in Arizona. There were 15,000 employees, 1,000 of whom were top engineers. By the 1960s, Hughes was developing the next generation Phoenix missile, fitted to Navy F-14 Tomcat jets, that used a radar-based guidance system similar to the Falcon. Later, the Maverick missile system represented another step. It was laser-guided, and allowed the pilot to see the target remotely on a television screen. Today, we call these weapons smart bombs. By the end of the 60s, driven by growing government orders, Howard Hughes would employ 80,000 workers. Finally, Hughes was a military mogul, but his advancing mental illness forced him to withdraw from day-to-day -day operations. It would be up to his managers to take his namesake companies to the next level into orbit. Howard Hughes, high-speed pilot, developer of the flying boat, and technology visionary, had by the 1960s developed another valuable skill, recruiting talented engineers and managers. This was crucial to his corporate survival because he'd ventured into engineering territory far beyond his expertise as a stick and rudder pilot. He was a hands-on guy when he was building the first racing planes because these essentially were glorified garages where a handful of people were doing the work and they were all working together and so forth. But later on, what he liked to do was bring into his operations talented people, good people, uh, people who were willing to take a risk in some areas who wanted to experiment because working for Hughes had a certain allure about it, a certain glamour. Here was this guy who'd set all of these records. He was this mythic person, even before he was very old in this world. By the early 1950s, Hughes' talented engineers had made the transition from fixed-wing aircraft to helicopters. Their first effort was a behemoth, known as the Flying Crane. The XH-17, which had a two-blade main rotor system with a diameter of 134 feet, was capable of flying at a gross weight of more than 50,000 pounds. The prototype didn't attract a production deal from the military, but it was the beginning of a productive time for Hughes Helicopter Division. Its engineers decided to go from large to small helicopters. By 1961, 
Hughes Helicopter Division was manufacturing a training and reconnaissance helicopter, the Model 269, for civilian and military use. It's maneuverable. You can see where you're going. It's very responsive to controls. Hughes engineers modified the tail rotor, making it smaller and therefore quieter. In this and later models, they also addressed an issue of pilot and passenger safety in the event of a crash by creating an energy-absorbing structure. This is designed so that the tubular structure and those beams across underneath will collapse first to absorb some energy. Then the bottom of the fuselage will collapse, and finally the seat structure will collapse. And this combination of those three gives the pilot a great deal of protection. The engineering decisions made by Hughes Group were considered so sound Designers continue to use them as helicopter technology advanced. The seat collapsing concept started with this helicopter. It was carried on into the 086 Cayuse and then into the H-64 Apache. And it's served a purpose very well in all of those. And by building on one another, we've been able to take account of the best features of each, keep getting a better and better helicopter. The 1960s also saw Hughes engineers shooting for the stars. They created, and in 1963, launched SYNCOM, the first geosynchronous communication satellite, enabling around the world live TV broadcasts. The conventional wisdom at the time was that such satellites were impractical. They were too heavy to be launched and too complicated to last long enough to be commercially attractive. That was the challenge. A geosynchronous satellite maintains an unchanging position over the planet, synchronizing each orbit with the revolution of the Earth. So if you were sitting on the ground, looking up at the satellite, it would appear to you always to be in the same spot. SYNCOM stabilized itself by rotating continuously, driven by small thrusters positioned along its cylindrical shape. By spinning this cylinder, it acted like a gyroscope. So in effect, it stabilized itself. In orbit 22,000 miles above the Earth, SYNCOM was in effect a relay. It received a signal from Earth, which it amplified, and then transmitted to a terrestrial receiver. Hughes satellites were later capable of transmitting thousands of simultaneous telephone conversations and hundreds of simultaneous color telecasts. But Hughes engineers had more innovations to bring to satellite technology. They created the ATS-1, the first satellite capable of taking a picture of an entire hemisphere of the Earth as viewed from space. Since we were using a spinning satellite, if we put a camera in, in the satellite, then after a certain number of revolutions, it would scan one strip, scan another strip, scan another strip, scan another strip. Pretty soon you had a complete picture of the Earth. Meteorologists soon realized that the images transmitted from the new satellite would allow them for the first time to keep real-time watch on hurricanes and other storm systems. Hughes found great success with his satellite division. His engineers developed what would eventually become known commercially as DirecTV, the first delivery of a television signal to a compact home satellite dish. It must have taken about 30 years of evolution before the satellites reached a point where they could have enough radiated power to permit the reception of television and small dishes that we have today, 18 inches dishes on the ground. I think it only took about two years to build the satellite itself. There are 20 million of them in the United States right now. There are 20 million homes that have them. Some of them have multiple dishes. The engineers Hughes put in place were making great technological strides, but Hughes watched their triumphs from afar. His increasingly precarious mental state pushed him deeper into isolation. In the fall of 1968, Hughes further cut himself off from human contact, moving into a Las Vegas hotel suite with blacked out windows. While in seclusion, he went on a $100 million buying spree, acquiring casinos, local airports, and a television station. 
and thus became the Silver State's biggest landlord. His net worth increased in other ways, because while antitrust regulations had forced Hughes to sell his controlling interest in TWA, in 1966, the sale created a windfall for him. After broker's fees, Hughes received a check for half a billion dollars. He added this to after-tax profits produced by his oil equipment business, as much as $20 million annually. In April of 1968, Fortune magazine declared Howard Hughes worth $1.3 billion. He was the richest man in America. But while his technological empire and wealth would expand greatly, his personal world would dramatically diminish. July 20th, 1969. A triumph for American technical know-how as Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon. Howard Hughes played a role in this history-making moment because three years earlier, the Hughes-designed Surveyor 1 became the first craft to soft land on the moon on June 1st, 1966. 36 minutes after settling down in the ocean of storms, the Hughes craft sent back the first televised photographs of the surface. I remember being in the control room at JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, when we made the first landing with Surveyor. And as a television picture developed, there was the landing leg of the Surveyor, there was the pad. I will never forget that because it was the first image that anyone had ever seen of the surface of, an, of another body in space. Retro rockets that applied the right amount of reverse thrust were the key to the successful landing of the Hughes craft. The retro rockets were controlled by, in effect, a radar signal that they generated by uh, bouncing a radar signal off the surface of the moon and then receiving it. And that way it could tell how far away the moon was. Later surveyor missions transmitted thousands of photographs and conducted chemical analyses of the lunar soil, preparing for manned landings to come. Some Hughes biographers speculate that he watched the lunar landing on TV from his dark Las Vegas hotel room. He lived, many believed, in a world of pain, drug addiction, and compulsive behavior. He's evidencing uh, signs of OCD in the foods he wants to eat. He has a standard meal that he orders. For uh, Howard Hughes, the standard meal was steak, mashed potatoes, and green peas, and a glass of milk. It would be downright bizarre when it came to the dessert because he liked chocolate cake, but he used a ruler. It had to be, you know, the edges of the chocolate cake had to be perfectly straight the way the cake was cut, and if it wasn't, it was sent back to the kitchen. As Hughes continued to struggle with his addiction and mental illness, his far-reaching empire continued to produce engineering marvels. By the early 1970s, his helicopter, aircraft, satellite, and electronics divisions were primary military suppliers. That made his companies a good contact for the CIA. The spy agency was aware that in April of 1968, a Soviet submarine had been lost, and it wanted to recover the vessel. To accomplish the task, the CIA turned to one of America's most secretive businessmen, Howard Hughes. The appeal of the Hughes operations was the, the great secrecy that shrouded almost all of Hughes's operations. He was a private businessman. Virtually all his companies were private, answerable to no stockholders. And here was a, an American corporation that could keep a secret. The Soviet submarine was carrying nuclear torpedoes and coating equipment when hydrogen gas built up inside it and exploded. It sank 17,000 feet to the bottom of the ocean. The CIA wanted to build a specialized mining ship to recover the Soviet sub. At 618 feet 8 inches, the Hughes Mining Barge, or HMB-1, was longer than two football fields. A steel A-frame rose from its deck to a height of 200 feet. At the center, there was an opening providing hidden access to the ocean. And through this opening, an onboard derrick was capable of lifting objects weighing as much as 14 million pounds. 
or reeling out more than three miles of pipe into the depths of the sea. HMB-1 was a mining barge in name only. The vessel, also known as the Hughes Glomar Explorer, had room for the entire Soviet submarine to be brought up inside. The salvage operation was only partially successful, as the sub broke in half as it was recovered. But the CIA was able to examine two Soviet nuclear torpedoes and coating equipment. A burial at sea was performed for the recovered remains of six Soviet crewmen. In 1975, a few years after the Glomar Explorer mission was complete, Howard Hughes was 70 years old. He had not been photographed in public since 1952 and had lived in a succession of darkened hotel suites, from Las Vegas to the Bahamas to London to Mexico. His companies were run by an army of managers, most of whom had never met their boss. As he wasted away in a world of perpetual darkness, Hughes had drifted far from the beloved dashing aviation hero of his early years. Now a shadowy enigma, mired in mental illness and addiction, he was daily ingesting massive amounts of Valium and injecting himself with codeine. In his final days, he stopped eating and weighed barely more than 100 pounds. Alarmed, his doctors put him on a plane bound for a Houston hospital. He died en route on April 5, 1976, at 1.27 p.m. He left behind an enormous legacy in aviation and technology. He set records around test tracks and around the globe. He proved that the world's largest wooden aircraft was flightworthy. Hughes and his engineers found the fresh air of innovation when others weren't able to get off the ground. Since Hughes died, the companies he founded have continued to do remarkable work, making a space probe that mapped Venus by radar and designing Galileo, the first spacecraft to penetrate Jupiter's atmosphere. A medical institute that Hughes founded conducts research today in nanotechnology, stem cells, and seeks a cure for obsessive compulsive disorder. Whenever we board a commercial airliner, watch television via satellite, or marvel at America's military might. We would do well to remember the man who died in torment. He flew faster than his peers, took risks that others avoided, and was at heart an aviator dedicated to the science and the art of innovation. <laughs>